All right, everyone, welcome back to another Fed meeting. Rates held steady. Here comes the Fed decision. Let's listen into it and we'll review the notes and get to uh, Jerome Powell's presser. Here we go. Meeting in a row. The Fed has been on hold. First time it's done so since early 2022. The Fed, however, is still, quote, determining the extent of additional policy firming, suggesting yep. that there is still a hiking bias in the statement and among the committee members. The committee saying it remains highly attentive to the inflation risk language precisely from the prior uh, 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 statement, as well as saying that inflation remains elevated. The economy was upgraded just a bit, uh, saying it's now uh, it grew at a strong pace in the third quarter compared to a solid pace in the previous sta statement. Job gains were also upgraded just a bit, saying they moderated instead of slowed in the prior statement. The statement also now me mentions tighter financial and credit conditions, adding the word financial uh, likely will weigh on the economy. Uh, that perhaps is a mention for the uh, rise in the 10-year yield and other yields that have right affected here. the economy. The decision was unanimous. And now we have a question, by the way, very, very similar statement, only a few words tweaked. Does the upgrade yep. to the economy now perhaps put additional rate hikes on the table? Or is the idea that this statement is so similar to the other one, one that led the Fed to pause? Does it lead you again to think, well, you know what? They're teeing up another pause here. I guess we may have to wait for the press conference to find out. All right, let's listen or let's go through the entire statement together. And then we're going to get our bingo card ready for when j Pow speaks. So what we have here is, first of all, it's Fed Day, November 1st. House hack expiration, uh, uh, fundraise expiration is today, 11.59 p.m. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity expanded at a strong pace in the third quarter. Uh, we're just looking for nominal word changes here. Job gains have moderated since earlier in the year, but remain strong. Look, the big deal is this Friday. Let's just be very clear. It's it, 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 the Friday. Fed days are just a reaction to the data that comes out. Uh, so while today is important, remember what probably is more important and might come up in the presser later. Let's write this down, okay? The JOLTS report this morning came in at 9.553. That's above expectations again. Remember, j he kind of gave up on this idea that we were going to get into a one-to-one -one balance. Remember that when Jay Powell told us, oh, yeah, don't worry. We're going to get to one to one. We're going to keep hiking all the way uh, until uh, we're in balance with how many unemployed individuals there are and how many people, how many job openings there are. So the, if you've got about six million unemployed, you're still sitting at uh, somewhere around uh, one and a half doing quick math from six to nine. Right. Point is, we're probably not going to get to one to one. The only change, is, so Jay Powell's kind of dropped that, but we'll see if he brings that up given that jobs data comes out in two days. As far as a red line of like what's actually been changed in this statement, I can underline for you exactly uh, what's different. So we're going to underline in red the words that are different. Uh, the date was changed. Economic activity expanded. The word expanded uh, was changed. This is from uh, has been expanding. Uh, so it's almost like they're kind of saying here, hey, uh, look, uh, economic activity did well in the third quarter. Remember that really high GDP print we had? 4.9% annualized. Keep in mind, that's multiplied by four, right? So when they annualize a number, they take uh, a GDP read for a quarter of about 1.22, and then they multiply it by four. That's how you get a 4.9 GDP read. Okay, what else is different? We know that job gains have moderated. Uh, that is right here. Job gains have moderated since earlier in the year, but remain strong. The last statement was that job gains, uh, so I'm going to write from, have slowed in recent months. Okay, this is a way of saying you've actually got a stronger jobs market. You're giving the Fed more of a license to keep putting pressure on rates. Remember how the Fed operates. They don't give a crap how expensive your restaurant food or your grocery food has gotten. They don't care how your stock portfolio is doing or, or, or real estate portfolio. They don't care about any of that. They only care about two things, stable prices, which will probably end up being stable high prices, right? And then max employment. Well, the more we have a strong jobs market, the longer we get Jerome keeping the boot on our neck. And that's the pain you're seeing uh, exemplified in the stock market now. 
Uh, so another thing that changed is tighter financial. They added the word financial right here, just like we heard on CNBC. Uh, and job gains have moderated. That's it. That's the only change right here that was made. So uh, underlined, I'll just make a little note here, underlined equals changes. Otherwise, let's also pay attention to what they kept. Uh, they kept inflation remains elevated. Uh, they're probably going to keep this until 2%, right? Uh, or, or they actually come out with fake, flexible average inflation targeting, which if we're going to put that on the bingo card, it should probably just be in a corner because they have not mentioned it at all, this entire tightening cycle. Uh, and they might not pull out fate until you actually start getting negative job prints. Think about that for a moment. If you get negative job prints, that's when I think they start cutting under the guise of fate. But until then, why? Why bring up flexible average inflation targeting? It's actually uh, spelled like that, F-A-I-T, flexible average inflation targeting. Uh, that's when they could argue that, well, we'll cut rates to support the economy, but not, uh, you know, not think that inflation will run away again. So after this uh, pause here, which was widely expected, treasury yields didn't really move much. The 10 years still down about eight bips. You've got the two years sitting down about eight as well. You've got an equilibrium there. So kind of keeping that inverted yield curve at about 20 bips inverted right now. Okay, so let's draw our bingo card here. You're welcome to throw in suggestions in the chat and in, in the uh, chat for uh, the bingo card. Uh, but what we'll do is we're going to write down things that we think the Federal Reserve uh, might talk about in their presser. So let's draw it like this. I'm going to go throw uh, flexible average inflation targeting in the corner over here uh, because I really don't think we're going to get that. Uh, I think I drew way too, uh, too many lines here. Bingo card. Let's find out. Uh, bingo card is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Oh, I actually did it right. But how do you have a middle box? I guess this is the middle box right here. Okay. So we need to put an easy one in the middle box, right? So, because that's usually the free one, right? Uh, how about this? j -Pow, cause I added more buy, I added an extra row today. j -Pow is on time, bro. That guy is like always on time. So, okay, we'll, we'll get a freebie right there, right? Uh, but what what else are we going to want to look for? We're going to want to hear disinflation would be nice. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised to hear them bring up multivariate core. And this is that problem we had from the New York Fed, where the New York Fed is telling us, hey, we might actually end up seeing uh, or, or we're currently seeing multivariate core inflation rotate up a little bit. If you didn't see that from my video this morning, I'll put it up on screen right now. It's this right here. This is going to be somewhat of an issue if uh, if it continues. It is normal to have this sort of volatility, but that upswing of inflation right there, not great. Now, keep in mind, once housing disinflation continues to roll over, we think we'll see pressure on that to the downside, given that housing accounts for half of a percentage point here. So watch for that. See these bands right here? 0.24 and 328, that's the high and the low. If you take off half of a percent, guess what? You're at 1.9 to 2.4. You're basically at a perfect uh, or, or nearly perfect level in terms of where the Fed wants to be if you bring housing to zero. The problem is you still have services popping off a little bit, right? This is the one that's very uh, wage sensitive. And you could see that right here. Services X housing accounted for 0.54%. Okay, I don't think we're going to get any kind of talk about transitory. The Fed really had egg on their face with, with uh, a claim to any kind of transitory inflation. I do personally think, think that inflation will prove to be transitory over many years. You know, I think we're going through a very volatile Nike swoosh, which I've always mentioned volatile, except we didn't have the volatile part at the beginning of the year. Now we're getting it all at the same time. And so it's a little painful. I still think it'll end up looking like that over years. Uh, so, you know, people were making fun of me at the beginning of the year, like, it's not very volatile, man. It's just straight up to the moon. I'm like, just wait, it comes. Uh, here it is. Uh, okay, so what else are we going to write down here? So we've got flexible average inflation target. We'll get disinflation. What we really want to hear, uh, we're going to hear about that housing disinflation. That's going to come up. Uh, I'm, I'm almost confident that'll come up. Uh, something that we want to see is what is the Fed's willingness to cut without jobs actually rolling over, right? So let's put that in the corner over here. Some comment about willingness to cut. 
without jobs or without unemployment going up because the economy just really isn't showing unemployment going up right now. You're seeing stress, smaller businesses, households, medium-sized businesses, but I don't think companies are willing to, to you know, uh, dive into this recession mindset of cut all the great labor they just took effort to uh, to try to find. Uh, you know, it's been very difficult for people to try to find uh, workers. So uh, let's, uh, let's see what other uh, wage price spiral. You know, I don't know. Ooh, does he bring out an iPad? Ooh, I like that one. We'll put that one in, uh, you know, over here on the right. I like that. Is he going to be on the iPad again for a second time? Did he end up liking the iPad or not? We could do that. Data driven. Yeah, we're, I mean, we're guaranteed going to hear that. So we'll go data driven. Uh, that's going to be, uh, you know, what, what, ooh, soft landing. I would like to hear that. Yeah, who wouldn't, right? Uh, what about recession? Is he going to mention the word recession? What about just uh, deflation? Will that word come up? Probably not. So we'll put that on the end. Recession, we'll put that here in the middle. Data driven, we know we're going to basically get that. So, I mean, this is really just a freebie. Uh, we'll just put it, you know, we'll put it right there. Uh, so uh, are we done? Are we going to hear something about being done? I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to say we should put in the corner here, uh, open to uh, further future rate hikes. Uh, if necessary, right? I think that's much more likely. You know, we're not trying to destroy our bingo card here. We're making our own bingo card. Situation in the Middle East. Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, are we going to... I mean, I think we'll have questions about the Middle East. I'd be nice to get his commentary on that. That's actually a good point. Uh, you know, they've they've uh, he's had a presser since. He had an interview where he touched on how disturbing it was. Janet Yellen talked about it's too soon to tell. Uh, you know, if the situation in the Middle East will be uh, a, a situation that is uh, something that causes inflation, depends on how long it lasts. Right now, it doesn't look like it's going to be over anytime soon. Uh, let's see. That was Janet Yellen. So stronger economy than anticipated. Oh, I'd like to see some talk about GDP having to be below trend, right? So GDP below trend growth, that's GDP or the economy below trend. Uh, it's uh, probably going to come up, but is he still going to require that? That's a question, right? Because what if inflation can get to target without below trend growth? Remember, there's there's a big difference between an economy growing and inflation. A capitalistic economy that grows should actually be deflating. The only reason we have inflation is because we print money. This is a fiat phenomenon. This is why Milton Friedman says inflation is a monetary phenomenon. It is not a capitalistic market phenomenon. These are very different things. And that sounds complicated because the bottom line is complicated. It's like there's been so much inflation and things have been so great for businesses. So doesn't that mean things being good for businesses means inflation? And the answer to that is no. Uh, all right. So utilizing our tools to get inflation lower, our tools, you know, it'd be interesting to see if they mention anything about other tools. Uh, so I'll, I'll put that other tools. They frequently do refer to that. Other tools are usually different forms of money printing. Think for a moment about the banking crisis. You know, a lot of people saw the banking crisis and said, oh, you know, this is it. We're, we're screwed. And what's so, f and, and that some people still think the banking crisis is going to come up again. The problem is the Federal Reserve basically turned on the money printer and eliminated the potential for a banking crisis again. They said all of these upside down bonds that you have on your balance sheets, basically all of them, we will say are essentially worth 100%. Even though they're upside down, we'll consider them and deem them to be worth 100% of their face value. That's pretty weird. You know, that is a form of money printing. Uh, core inflation. Okay. Yeah. Well, so like a super core comment. So comments about super core, we, we know what we, what we don't want to see is uh, I'll give it, we'll put some easy ones here. Okay. So we know we're going to have goods disinflation continuing. We know we're going to have housing disinflation, uh, continuing, uh, this is really starting, but what we really want to hear is, uh, any kind of risk of like, what is J Pow seeing in services disinflation. Uh, we would like to say that services disinflation is starting, okay? 
We do not want that it's worsening. So we want to see starting or continuing. That's what we want to see. Uh, we we really, you know, recession comment, uh, soft landing. Okay, good. You hear these words from him. Sometimes we go press conferences without hearing those words. Uh, this is Fed bingo. Yeah, not leaving out the possibility for more rates. Yep, we have that. Open to future hikes. Good. Martial law. <laughs> what is this, man? Is this, is this COVID? <laughs> uh, ooh, uh, what? Is, is somebody going to ask a stupid question that crashes the market? <laughs> uh, that's a tough one to write down. Uh, that's Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Uh, I want to know, I really want to know about jobs. Like how much, if I'm there, I'm asking J-Pal, look, man, are you really going to keep raising rates until you destroy the jobs market? Or are you willing to just sit here with essentially a strong labor market as long as Inflation is trending down. Now, keep in mind, the Fed pays attention to ECI. That's the Employment Cost Index. That one actually just beat estimates for Q3. So I'd like to see ECI comments. Again, that is the Employment Cost Index. Uh, it's a very important one. The Federal Reserve likes this. It, this one just came in at 1.1 versus 1%. Uh, and that is for the uh, quarter uh, that is Q3 and that is not an annualized figure. So that is uh, annualized going to put you at about 4.4%, right? Because you multiply by four employment cost index quarter over quarter. Uh, yep. There it is on the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Compensation increased 1.1% for civilian workers seasonally adjusted June 23 to September 23. Year-over-year year, compensation rose 4.3%. Wages and salaries rose 4.6%. So this is a little bit of a problem, right? Because you have this year-over-year year, uh, change that's actually not coming in line with what the balance is the Fed wants. The Fed wants this to be at 3%. And we're running at about 4 to 4.4% right now. So to be 3%, we would have to be... 0.75 verse uh, goal. So are we stagnating on those goals, right? Uh, ooh, that would be an interesting word. Uh, hold on, let's see here. I don't think we'll hear him say that, stagnating here. What I would like to hear is maybe some comment about Eurozone stagnation. The reason you might think Eurozone stagnation is because they just had a negative GDP print. Right. And, and they're a uh, negative 0.1%. They were expecting to be at flat. All right. Anything else? Uh, let's see here. Let's see here. Consumer strength. Strength of the consumer. Mentioning of Paul Volcker. Ooh, Paul Volcker. Uh, a Paul Volcker mentioned that would be very interesting. That would be also very scary. Uh, what we want is we want uh, a Paul Volcker or Aaron. Aaron um, was, I think it Burns, right? Aaron Burns, Burr, Burr. Let me see. I always forget his last name. Aaron Burr. No, I'll I'll, I'll get it out. But anyway, um, in the mid 1970s, the guy who basically lost control of inflation. Uh, I can't remember this guy's name for some reason. But anyway, uh, any mention of of this Arthur Burn? That's what it was. Oh gosh, Kevin. Arthur Burns. Hello. Okay, there we go. Arthur Burns was at either of those mentions are bad, right? Because Paul Volcker is like, we go higher. Arthur Burns is you don't cut too soon, right? So Arthur Burns equals don't cut too soon because you don't want to repeat the mistakes. And Paul Volcker is higher rates. And then if you get a mention of uh, Alan Greenspan, I'll put this in the corner. Alan Greenspan this is a good one. This is opportunistic disinflation. Okay. That would be Alan Greenspan. So we'll, we'll put that on our bingo card over here. Uh, then we have, let's see here. Let's go to geopolitical. Yeah. Did we, oh yeah. How are we going to put Israel in here? Did we put Israel in here? No, not yet. Well, Middle East, Middle East, geopolitical, Israel, We'll throw that in. We've got a few more words that we could throw in here. 
and j Powell will be speaking shortly. Debt. Uh, the debt ceiling. Yeah, you know, like Congress, right? Fiscal and debt. Uh, treasury issuance. Treasury issuance. Debt. Uh, and Congress, which reminds me uh, we should talk about... Um, uh, oh, what about uh, present yields, right? The surge in yields, recent surge in yields. That'll be a good one. Uh, what else do we want to hear from him on? Uh, let's see here. Asking someone to repeat the question. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, some kind of reset. China. Oh, those are good ones. Uh, let me see here what the suits are saying while we wait. Uh Bleakly Financial, well, that's a weird word for a financial group, but Bleakly Financial Group calls attention to one word from uh, the statement, which is tighter financial conditions. Everything else remains uh, pretty identical. Okay. Two items that may pop up during the press conference, labor agreements between auto companies and what that means. Well, we don't have that written down yet. The UAW, I mean, basically they've come to terms but is that going to mean wage inflation, right? UAW wage inflation. I like that one. I'm now taking suggestions from the suits. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, we read the tweaks to the policy statement as somewhat dovish. Uh, why? Uh, emphasizing instead the moderation in job gains. Careful to state the recent strength in activ and activity has already passed, considering the various ways officials could have crafted a more hawkish statement, like upside surprises. Uh, it looks like they're inclined to extend their pause. You know, I think we should write down pause, honestly. Uh, that that I mean, but that's open to future hikes. But it, I mean, he might mention the word pause, right? I think that's a that's a good line to have in there. I think our Fed bingo card is pretty ready here. Okay, uh, we are now eight minutes away from J-PAL. Uh, keep in mind, if you have uh, if you have questions about House Hack, the fundraise ends today at 11.59. You can ask questions here if you want. I can briefly bring some of them up before uh, J-PAL comes out, and uh, J-PAL will be out in about uh, seven minutes here. But I'm going to keep looking at some of the things the suits are talking about here. Financial conditions have indeed tightened over the past month. I'm going to pull up the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. Financial Conditions Index. The Financial Conditions Index is something that j -Pal looks at. Uh, they want financial conditions to be tighter, and congratulations, they have gotten tighter financial conditions. Minimum investment right now is 5K for House Hack. Yeah, we dropped that to 5K. There were a lot of people who were, who were really asking for that. I mean, we were getting, oh, it felt like dozens of inquiries daily for that. Uh, okay, so... Uh, let's see here. Here, the uh, Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index is right here. And so you can see that here. Delinquency rates, that's a good one. Um, but delinquency rates, honestly, are pretty stable. Uh, so I, I don't know that that one's necessary for our bingo card, but we'll see. It, that could come up. But anyway, this right here is the Financial Conditions Index. Uh, the financial conditions index, as you can see, in all of 2023, it's been coming down. The trend has been down in 2023, with the exception of really the last few weeks here. Look at this when I draw sort of a trend line, right? We draw a trend right here. Look at that decline in financial conditions from peak in 22. We're almost back to peak. These are pretty serious. Like the economy, the actual market is doing a lot of work for the Federal Reserve for them. Let's go to the five-year break even as well. Uh, we are now five minutes away from j -Pow. Okay, five-year break even comes down to 2.34. And then uh, let's look at the – that's that's good. It's not as low as it was. We really want to see this keep coming down. It was really low during the AI bubble period. Uh, I still think chips are a deal in AI, but I'm still equally, just like I was back then, fearful about software AI plays. I think the big concern that j -Pow should have is the five-year forward, but I don't know how much j -Pow thinks he can control the five-year forward. This is the five-year forward inflation break-even rate. It's basically the market's inflation expectations five years out. 
uh, for the next five years forward. And as you can see, I mean, these inflation expectations have just been skyrocketing. Uh, you know, I mean, just like trying to throw a messy trend line over here, no matter where you put it, you, you could see what the trend is. The trend is clearly well up. Uh, and, uh, you know, if anything, I mean, if I were to draw a more, you know, uh, supported line here, it'd be something like this. It, it really goes to show that we've gone well above uh, the trend that we had in 2022. Uh, we are way above that in terms of inflation expectations. But again, I don't know how much the Fed actually thinks they can control that line. So I think the Fed feels more comfortable in being able to control the current set of next five year inflation expectations. But even that one has gotten elevated. Remember, the Fed didn't actually cut until this chart the last time was down at like 1.6%. It's at 2.34 right now. Crazy, right? No, the limit for investing in house hack will not be reduced uh, anymore. 5K is the minimum. Sorry about that. So no chance of that. Thanks for asking, though. Make sure you go to househack.com and you can read the offering circular there so you could be uh, fully informed with uh, with the startup. So anyway, this is what we have right now for our Federal Reserve uh, bingo card. We are now uh, three and a half minutes away from Jay Powell. We are looking for more updates from the suits. Uh, it looks like, uh, okay, yep, the suit's now talking about the five-year break-even, the five-year forward break-even as well. Indeed, the market measure of long-term inflation expectation has quietly been creeping up. It's not at levels that will alarm Fed officials yet. It's still worth monitoring, though. It's almost like they're listening to my live stream. <laughs> anyway, uh, I could kid, right? Reporters in the room just got the five-minute warning. Okay, that was uh, you know a minute and a half ago, so it looks like they expect to be on time. So we'll, we'll get our little free one in the bingo card. Looking at some more commentary here, KPMJ says that uh, it looks uh, right now the concern is around May and June and where the Fed will be then. Will each meeting be live as it is now or are we going to get a little bit more guidance? Richard Clarita, who's no longer at the Fed, does say that there's risk that inflation remains too stubborn. Meat and potatoes today will likely be in the press conference. This is really just talking about like the the core uh, problems in terms of why leave rates unchanged. It's probably going to be financial conditions. Honestly, that's probably how they're going to try to defend this uh, this pause. The way they'll defend the pause is by saying, "Oh well, financial conditions are tighter, so some of our work was done for us." Maybe we should put that in the bingo card since we're so confident about that. Uh, why don't we move uh, disinflation to the deflation thing right here? And then, or, or you know what? No, because those are different. Let's kill the iPad one. And let's say right here that, um, oh, well, here it is. Recent surge in yields. Recent surge in yields done some work for us. There we go. Okay. So we're just adding a little bit of clarity in terms of what our expectations are right here. Okay. There we go. So, I mean, this is I think the market is pretty primed for what j is planning on saying uh, frequently. Uh, Jerome Powell's pressers have led the market to go up after the pressers, but not the last two or three times. I mean, since like July 19th, everything's just been a poopy doopy show. Uh, it's been a disaster. So let's listen in over here for a moment. In the same direction as a larger deficit. In fact, the Treasury's got a fund not just to the deficit, but effectively the... Yes, you can invest via a retirement account, but you'd have to find a company that allows directed investments. So you would go to like a directed IRA. If you go to the FAQs on househack.com, you, you'll see that there. The arena as an important topic of discussion. I really I, do. I, you know, and I just, I guess I, I'm trying to figure how would, what would be the most elegant way for them to achieve their monetary policy goals at this point? Doing more of it, doing less of it, more interest rate hikes, fewer hikes, trying to get the curve through the balance sheet. I don't think they should be moving it around a whole lot. I think it having it not on automatic pilot, but in the background is important. But automatic actually, pilot. I think they're doing a good job with it now because given the fact the marketplace has got this notion, we need to have a positive term premium mm -hmm. in the curve, uh, and that is tightening financial conditions, then QT actually contributes to that mm -hmm. in giving you a higher term premium, which means that an unchanged 
policy rate can give you tighter financial conditions, yes. and QT is contributing to that. So the Fed doesn't have to brute force up financial condition tightness with the policy rate that QT can do some of the work along oh. with uh, the, uh, the marketplace. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Bro, he better be on time, man. That was supposed to be a freebie. Oh, here he is. He's coming. So, Chair Powell, so why don't we interrupt? <laughs> Paul, great to be with you. Great Thank to you be with you. Much. Thank you. Here comes the chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. He said, Max, we understand first. the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Since early last year, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. Yes. We have raised our policy interest rate by five and a quarter percentage points but and have bro. continued to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk pace. The stance of policy is restrictive, meaning that tight policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation, and the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. Is restrictive. Today, we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Given how far we have come, along with the uncertainties and risks we face, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will make decisions about the extent of additional policy firming and how long policy will remain restrictive based on the totality of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a strong pace and well above earlier expectations. In the third quarter, real GDP is estimated to have risen an outsized annual rate of 4.9%, boosted by a surge in consumer spending. After picking up somewhat over the summer, activity in the housing sector has flattened out and remains well below levels of a year ago, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 266,000 jobs per month, a strong pace that is nevertheless below that seen earlier in the year. The unemployment rate remains low at 3.8%. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers. The labor force participation rate has moved up since late last year, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years, and immigration has rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. Nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. Although, although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2%. Total PCE prices rose 3.4% over the 12 months ending in September. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 3.7%. Inflation has moderated since the middle of last year and readings over the summer were quite favorable. But a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. Build confidence. The process of getting inflation sustainably down to 2% has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, Wait. especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. You got a teleprompter. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate 
and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2% objective. As I noted earlier, since early last year, we have raised our policy rate by five and a quarter percentage points, and we have decreased our securities holdings by more than $1 trillion. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent, and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. We are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to 2% over time and to keeping policy restrictive until we are confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. We are attentive to recent data showing the resilience of economic growth and demand for labor, evidence of growth persistently above potential, or that tightness in the labor market is no longer easing could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of monetary policy. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, driven by higher longer term bond yields, among other factors. Because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy, we monitor financial developments closely. In light of the uncertainties and risks and how far we have come, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook and for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2% over time, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below potential growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission. We at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your I like him twice now reiterating maximum employment. That's good. That's really good that he twice reiterated that. The market likes it so far. Thank you for doing this. Uh, to what you referenced, the, the rise in long-term bond yields, to what degree did that supplant uh, action by the Fed at this meeting? Just leave, Dre, pal. Walk Thanks away. Thanks for your question. So um, I'll talk about bond yields, but I, I want to take a second and just sort of set the broader context in which we're, we're looking at that. So. If you, if you look at the situation, let's look at the economy first. Inflation has been coming down, but it's still running well above our 2% target. The labor market has been rebalancing, but it's still very tight by many measures. GDP growth has been strong, although many forecasters are forecasting, and they have been forecasting that it will slow. As for the committee, we are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time and we're not confident yet that we have achieved such a stance. So that is the broader context in, into which this, the strong economy and all the things I said, that's the context in which we're looking at this question uh, of rates. So um, obviously we're, we're monitoring, we're attentive to the increase in longer term yields and which have contributed to uh, a tightening of broader financial conditions since the summer. As I mentioned, persistent changes in broader financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy in this case, the tighter financial conditions we're seeing from higher long-term rates, but also from other sources like the stronger dollar and, and lower equity prices could matter for future rate decisions as long as two, two conditions are satisfied. The first is that the tighter conditions would need to be persistent, and uh, that is something that remains to be seen. Um, but, but that's critical. We're, you know, if things are fluctuating back and forth, that's not what we're looking for. With financial conditions, we're looking for persistent changes that are material. The second thing is that, that, that the, the longer-term rates that have moved up, they can't simply be a reflection of, of expected policy moves from us 
uh, that we would then if that if we didn't follow through on them, then then the, then the rates would come back down. So the and I would say on that, it does not appear that an expectation of higher near term policy rates is causing the increase in longer term rates. So um, in the meantime, though, uh, perhaps the most important thing is that these higher treasury yields are showing through to higher borrowing costs for households and businesses. And those higher costs are going to weigh on economic activity to the extent this tightening persists. And, you know, the, the mind's eye goes to the 8%, near 8% uh, mortgage rate, which which could have, you know, pretty significant effect on housing. So that's how I would answer your question. Just as a quick follow-on to be clear on this, um, in your opening statement and just now, I, I, you, you seem to imply that you are not yet confident that financial conditions are restrictive enough to, to finish the fight. Is that true? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, Darn it. You know, to say it a different way, we haven't made any decisions about about future meetings. Um, we have that's not made a determination, uh, and we're not. Nasdaq's I will fine. say that we're we're not confident at this time that we've reached such a stance. We're not confident that we haven't. We're not confident that we have, and that's that is is the way we're going to be going into these future meetings is to be you know just determining the extent of any additional further policy may, uh, tightening that that may be appropriate to return inflation to two percent over time. Rip. Hi, Chair yeah, Powell. Thank good. you so much for taking our questions. I wonder, you know, if you don't raise interest rates in December, would the presumption be that at that point that we should expect that rates are at their peak, or is there a possibility of restarting rate increases next year? Good question. And are there any costs to taking a more extended pause? So, um, let me start by saying we haven't made a decision about September. You're asking a, a hypothetical there, but, but December. We're, we're going into this December meeting. We'll get, as you know, two more inflation readings, two more uh, labor market readings, some data on uh, on economic activity. Uh, and so we'll be taking, and also the broader situation, the broader financial condition situation and, and the broader world situation. We'll be looking at all those things as we make a decision in December. We haven't made that decision. I would say though that, that uh, the idea that if you the, the idea that you wouldn't would be difficult to to raise again after stopping for a meeting or two is just not right. I mean, the committee will always do what it what it thinks is appropriate at the time. And again, we haven't made any decisions about at all about December. We didn't even we didn't talk about making a decision in December today. Really, it was a decision for this meeting and and understanding broader things. Rip. <laughs> Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, there Chair he is. Powell, did the Fed staff put a recession back into the baseline forecast uh, oh. in the materials for today's meeting? And how much does this tightening in financial conditions substitute for rate hikes if the tightening is persistent? You had said it was worth maybe a quarter point when we had the bank failure in the spring. What is it here on something that's presumably more straightforward and more familiar to simulate? So I guess uh, I don't want to answer your question about the um, about the recession, but the answer is no. I think I have to answer it since we since we did uh, publicly say in the minutes you'll you'll know anyway in the minutes the, the staff did not put our, our session back in. Uh, I mean, it would be hard to see how you would do that if you look at the um, look at the activity we've seen recently, uh, which is wow. not really indicative of, of a recession in the near term. In terms of um, how to think about translation into uh, rate hikes, I think it's. It's just too early to be doing that. And the main reason is we just don't know how persistent this will be. You can see how volatile it is. Different kinds of news will affect the level of rates. I think any kind of an estimate that was you know, precise would hang out there and have a great chance of looking wrong very quickly. So I think what we can say is that financial conditions have, have clearly tightened. And you can see that in the rates that, that consumers and, house, and households and businesses are paying now. And over time, that will have an effect. We just don't know how persistent it's going to be, and, and it's tough to try to translate that in a way that I'd be comfortable communicating into uh, how many rate hikes that is. What makes you confident that tighter financial conditions will slow above trend growth when 500 basis points of rate hikes, QT, and a minor banking crisis have not thus far? Well, <laughs> it's, that, that's... Uh, uh, you know, the way our policy works is, and sometimes it works with lags, of course, which can yep. be long and variable, but ultimately, if you if you raise the, the you know, raise interest rates, you do see 
uh, the, those effects. And you see those effects in the economy now. You see what's happening in the housing market. You're seeing that now. You're, you'll see, uh, if you look at surveys uh, of people, it's not a good time, they think, to buy durable goods of various kinds because rates are so high now. Yep. Uh, I mentioned again, we're, we're getting reports from housing that the effects of this, of this could be quite significant. But oh. you're right. The, this has been a resilient economy, oh. and it's, I think, been surprising in its resilience. And there are, there are a number of possible reasons why that may be. Um, our job is to, is, to, is to achieve maximum employment and price stability. And so we take the economy as it comes. It has been resilient. Uh, so we just uh, we take it as it is. Did you hear that line? We're getting reports. The effects of this high rates on housing could be quite significant coming ahead. In terms of the thresholds that you've laid out, um, house hack, baby, warrant further tightening. Um, the additional evidence of persistently above trend growth or some kind of reversal in the recent easing of labor market tightness that seems to suggest something more powerful than just one more quarter point rate hike would be necessary. And I'm just curious if, if that's how the the committee sees it. So we've identified those factors. Those, those are not meant to be the only factors or a specific test that we're going to be applying with, with some metrics behind it. Really, we're going to be looking at the broader picture and you know what's happening with our progress to, toward the 2% inflation goal. Is the labor market continuing to broadly cool off and achieve a better balance? We'll be looking at that. You know, growth, we look at growth insofar as it, it has implications for our two mandate goals. We look at that. And we look at broader financial conditions. So we'll be looking at all of those things as we reach a judgment, uh, you know, whether we need to further tighten policy. And if we do reach that judgment, then we will further tighten policy. Okay. And, and just in terms of the tightening of financial conditions, if that is having some kind of offsetting um, effect in terms of the need to potentially, again, raise rates, what then is the potential impact on the trajectory of, of rate cuts? Could we see those maybe pulled forward Whoa. or have to see... Um, more than than what the September SEP indicated. So it's it's the fact is the committee is not thinking about rate cuts right now at all. We're not talking about rate cuts. We're still very focused on the first question, which is mm -hmm. have we re have we achieved a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restrictive to bring in, bring inflation down to two percent over time sustainably? That is the question we're focusing on. The next question, as you know, will be for how long will we remain restrictive? Will policy remain restrictive? And what we said there is that we'll, we'll keep policy restrictive until we're confident that inflation is, is on a sustainable path down to 2%. That'll be the next question. But honestly, right now, we're really tightly focused on the first question. The question of rates cuts just, just doesn't come up because I think it, the, the first, it's so important to get that first question you know, as, as close to right as you can. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, I guess I had assumed that there was a tightening bias in the committee. You say in the statement you're looking to assess the appropriate stance of monetary policy, uh, the extent to which uh, you, may, you may need to hike additionally. You, you didn't say earlier that you were sufficiently restrictive. There were forecasts for two rate hikes among most members of the committee. But then you just said that, you know, we're, we, don't, we haven't made a determination. Would you say the bias right now is neutral, that there is no disposition to hike again, and that the committee largely has moved off of this forecast for two hikes? We're, we're, sorry, one additional hike. I think you're talking about one additional. Yeah, no, I, I, no I, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say, I mean, the, the language, you know, looking at it here, uh, in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation 2% over time, that's the question we're asking. So is so, it right to think of that as a, a hiking bias is still in the committee here? We haven't used that term, but y y it's fair to say that's the question we're asking is, should we hike more? It's not, it's not uh, you know, and that, that, that is the question. And you're right that it, in September, we wrote down one additional rate hike. But, you know, we'll write down another forecast, as you know, in December. Chris. Uh, thank you, Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Um, well... Since the last meeting, the auto workers strike has finished, uh, oil prices have leveled off. Uh, and yet on the other hand, you have the outbreak of war between uh, Israel and Hamas. How do you see all those factors taken together affecting the economy uh, going forward? How are you thinking about those? Um, so there, there are significant issues out there. As you, as you point out, um, global uh, geopolitical tensions are certainly elevated. And that goes for the war in Ukraine. It goes for the war between Israel and Hamas. Uh, we're monitoring that 
our job is to monitor those things for their economic uh, implications. Um, so the UAW strike right now is, is um, uh, appears to be coming to an end. Oil prices have flattened out. They haven't gone down, but I guess they've gone down a little bit from their earlier peak. Um, another one is the, the possibility of government shutdown. We don't know about that one. So there's plenty of, of risk out there. Um, but I, I would go back to the, you know, the bigger picture for, from our standpoint is, is we've got a very strong economy, strong labor market, making progress on the labor market, making progress on inflation. And um, we're very focused on uh, getting confident that we have achieved a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive. That's really our focus. Great. And just one quick thing. You uh, last month had gone to York, Pennsylvania, where you talked to a lot of, or yeah, last month, where you talked to a lot of small business owners. Just curious, what sentiments did you hear from them or what did you pick up on? And what would you, was there anything that surprised you the most in terms of what they talked about? Yep. I wouldn't say I was terribly surprised. I was, I was very impressed by uh, York as a town with a real strategy. And I would say it's, uh, it's very impressive what the people there uh, have, have put together uh, in the face of, you know, some difficult longer run trends about offshoring of manufacturing and that kind of thing. They've, they've done a, a great job as a, as a city, I think. You know, what you hear and it's, is c consistent there, which is people are really suffering under high inflation. You were there. We talked to some people who, you know, were feeling that in their businesses and other people who were feeling it in their home lives as well. You know, it's it's painful for people, particularly people who, you know, who don't have a lot of extra financial resources, who are spending most of their incoming, uh, you know, income on uh, the, the essentials of life. So we know that. It, that that wasn't new, but that did come through very clearly uh, in, in, in the conversations we had in New York. And, you know, I, I walked away from that even, you know, I mean, just thinking that, that we really, the, the best thing we can do for the U.S. is to restore price stability uh, fully restore price stability and not fail in that task and do it as quickly as possible, but but also with the least damage we we can. Rachel. Hmm. Hi, Chair Powell. Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You've spoken before about the pain that would likely be coming for the economy in order to get inflation down. But since the economy has not responded to rate hikes in ways that would normally be expected, have you changed your views on that at all and how necessary or inevitable that kind of pain would be, say, for the labor market or overall growth? Well, I think everyone has been very gratified to see that we've been able to achieve, you know, pretty significant progress on inflation without seeing the kind of increase in unemployment that has been very typical of rate hiking cycles like this one. So that's that's a historically unusual and and very welcome result. And the same is true of growth. You know, we've we've been saying that we need to see below potential growth, and growth has been strong, but yet we're still seeing this. I think I still believe, and my colleagues, for the most part, I think still believe so that it is likely to be true. It is still likely to be true, not a certainty, but likely that we will need to see some slower growth and some softening in the labor market, in labor market right. conditions, to get to you know to to fully restore price stability. Now what so, you want. But it's a, it's only a good thing that we haven't seen. And I think we know why. <clears throat> you know, since since we lifted off, we we have understood that there are really two processes at work here. One of them, one of which is the unwinding of the distortions to both supply and demand from the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And the other is is you know restrictive monetary policy, which is moderating demand and giving the supply side time to time to recover, time and space to recover. So you see those two forces now working together to bring down inflation. But it's that that first one can bring down inflation without the need for higher unemployment or slower growth. It's just, it's supply, you know, supply side improvements like mm. um, shortages and bottlenecks and that kind of thing going away. It's getting, you know, a significant increase in the size of the labor market, both from labor force participation and from immigration. That's a big supply side, uh, you know, gain that is really helping the economy. And it's part of why part of why GDP is so high is because we're getting that that supply. So we welcome that. Um, but I think those things will run their course and we're probably still going to be left. We think and I think we'll still be left with a, with 
some ground to cover to get back to full price stability. And, and that's where monetary policy and, and what we do in, with demand is, is still going to be important. Not against that backdrop, line. if you've gotten any clarity <clears throat> on lags, if you have an economy that's been so resilient to high rate increases, does that suggest to you that there isn't necessarily this huge wave of tightening that's still coming through the pipeline and that it may have already come into effect? You know, I, I continue to think it's very hard to say. So it's it's been one year at this meeting. One year ago, this was the fourth of our 75 basis points hike, hikes. So that's a full year since then. I think we are seeing the effects of, of all the hiking we did last year and, and this year. We're seeing it. It's very hard to know exactly what that might be. But you can, for example, an, an example of where, where you wouldn't have felt this yet is, is debt that had been termed out. Uh, it, but it's going to come due and have to get rolled over next year or the year after. So, And there are little things like that where the effects are just taking time to get into the economy. So I, don't, uh, I, th I think we have to make monetary policy under great uncertainty about how long the lags are. I think trying to make a clear, get a clear answer and say, oh, I'm just going to assume this is a really not a good way to do it. And this is one of the reasons why we have slowed the process down this year was to give monetary policy time to get into the economy. And it takes time. We know that. And you can't rush it. So doing slowing down is giving us, I think, a better sense of, of how much more we need to do if we need to do more. Michael McKee from uh, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Um, I'm trying to connect the dots here. Um, one quick clarification I want to ask uh, about um, Rachel's question is you said you need slower growth. You had always said before a period of lower uh, than trend growth. Uh, has Ooh. that changed? And two, it sounds to me like uh, you're basically saying here that the kind of the dot plots out the window, that every meeting is live with the possibility of a rate increase for right now, doesn't matter about the turn of the, uh, the year, and that there's not an objective way to determine whether or not you've got enough uh, tightening in the system. It's uh, just going to be a sub subjective judgment meeting by meeting. Very good well, so questions. Let's talk about the dot plot first. So the dot plot is a is a <clears throat> a picture in time of what the people on the committee thinks is likely to be a mo appropriate monetary policy in light of their own personal economic forecast. In principle, when things change, it's not that's not like a plan flop. that anybody's agreed to or that we will do. That's a forecast that would change. For example, I mean, many things could change that would cause people to say. I wouldn't write down that dot, you know, six weeks later. Think of the number of things that could change your mind on that. So I think I think the the efficacy of the dot plot probably decays over the three months period between that meeting and the next meeting. But nonetheless, like it's, it's out there and we don't we, we do personally uh, uh, update our forecast, but we don't formally update the dot plot. So, right. you know, I, I think we try to be as transparent as we can about the way we're thinking about these things. We, we're, we're laying out there our thinking and. You know, as we approach the meeting, we'll we'll all, be, you know, my colleagues and I will be talking about how we're processing that data. In terms of, <clears throat> so I, I, we're not really changing the way. In terms of uh, growth, uh, what I said was below potential. So what what you have here recently is growth that is that is um, temporarily potential growth is elevated for a year or two right now over its trend level. So the right way to think about it is what's potential growth this year. Or trend, people think trend growth over a long period of time is a little bit less than 2%, or I would say just around 2%. But um, what we've had is with, with the you know, improvement in the size of the labor force, as I mentioned, through both participation and uh, immigration, and with the, the, you know, the better functioning in the labor market and with, with uh, the, you know, the unwinding of the supply chain and shortages and those kinds of things, you're seeing actually elevated potential growth. There's catch up growth that can happen in potential. And that means that if you're growing, you could be growing at 2% this year and still be going, growing below the increase in the potential output of the economy. I hope that's clear. That's really what's going on. So that's, that's why I would say it as below wow. potential. But if you can redefine uh, about the, uh, meeting by meeting, are we essentially now supposed to assume that it's a meeting by meeting live meeting with a chance of a rate increase that will be decided on uh, subjective uh, criteria rather than objective at each meeting. I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know that I want to just accept anybody's characterization, but I'll, I'll tell you how we're doing this. So 
<clears throat> we're going meeting by meeting. We're asking ourselves whether we've achieved a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. That's the question we're asking. We're looking at the full range of economic data, including financial conditions and all of those things that we look at. And then we're, we're you know, we, we've, we've, we've come very far with this rate hiking cycle, very far. And you saw the spread at, in, at the September meeting of, you know, it's a relatively small spread of people think one or two additional hikes. So you're close to the, to the end of the cycle. That's, that was an impression as of a belief as of September. It's not a promise or a plan of the future. And so we're going into these meetings one by one. We're looking at the data. As I mentioned, we're also, you know, we've, we're, being, we're being careful. We're proceeding carefully because we can proceed carefully at this time. Monetary policy is restrictive. We see its effects, uh, particularly in interest-sensitive interest spending and other channels. So that's how I think about it. <clears throat> wow. This is huge. This is good. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with Axios. Um, in light of the run-up in long-term yields that we've seen the last several weeks, uh, have you given any consideration to the pace of your asset runoff program? Uh, and if there were a judgment that, higher, that the uh, higher term premium was endangering the dual mandate goals, would that be reason to think about slowing or suspending QT? Or should we think of that as more of a technical question around reserves? So committee is not considering uh, changing the pace of balance sheet runoff. It's not something we're talking about or considering. That's fine. Um, and I, I know there are, there are many candidate explanations for why rates have been going up. Uh, and QT is certainly on that list. It may be playing a relatively small effect, although I would say at $3.3 trillion in reserves, it's not, I think, I think it's hard to make a case that reserves are even close to scarce at this point. So that's not something that we're, that we're looking at right now. <clears throat> Victoria. Hi, That's uh, not a Victoria big deal. Guido with Politico. I wanted to ask about the Basel III uh, endgame capital proposal. Uh, you know, you've gotten a lot of pushback from people on different aspects of the proposal, and you yourself expressed some reservations. And I'm just curious, um, could you accept finalizing that proposal without significant changes? So that proposal is out for comment, and uh, we expect a lot of comment. We won't get those comments until the end of uh, well, well into next year. You know, we've extended it, the deadline and we'll take them seriously. We'll read them. Well, I, I'll say what, what I do expect is that we will we will come to a we're a consensus driven organization. We'll come to a package that that has broad support on the board. So is broad support mean more support than the proposal had? It means broad support. <laughs> Janelle Marte with Bloomberg. So um, in addition to persistence, when you look at long-term treasury yields, what else are you watching to evaluate how those tighter financial conditions are hitting the economy and if it will lessen the need for further tightening? Also, do you think that those higher yields could affect um, banking stress? Never heard of this person before. So what do we look at? <clears throat> we look at a very wide range of financial conditions. And in fact, as, as you'll know, uh, uh, different organizations publish different financial conditions indexes, which can have, you know, seven or eight variables. Are they going to have a hundred variables? Remember so how I showed you Goldman Sachs earlier? Environment. And we, we tend to look at a few of them. I'm not going to give you the names, but they're, you know, they're a few of the common ones that people look at. And so they're looking at things like the level of the dollar, the level of equity prices, uh, the level of rates, the credit spreads. Sometimes uh, they're they're pulling in credit availability and things like that. So it isn't any one thing. We, we would never look at, for example, long-term treasury rates in isolation. Uh, nor will we ignore them. But we, we would look at them as bro as part of a broader picture. Here, and they do play a role, of course, in in many uh, of the major standard uh, financial condition indexes. Your second Spike. question was. Uh, banking stress. So it's something we're watching. As you know, we, we did have, um, there were issues with interest rate risk uh, and also, um, you know, uh, funding uninsured deposits uh, in, in the March, the things we went through in March and thereafter. And so we've been working a lot with financial institutions to make sure that they have uh, good funding plans and good, and, uh, and that they have a plan for how to deal with, with um, you know, the kind of portfolio uh, unrealized losses that they have. We do think the banking system is is quite resilient. We we had you know a handful of bank failures, but uh, so that's that's what we're out there doing. And um, 
we don't have any reason to think that this that these right hikes uh, are materially changing that picture, which is one of a strong banking system and one where there's a, a strong focus by banks and by supervisors on liquidity, on funding, and, and those sorts of things. Scott. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Scott Horsley from NPR. Last week, you and your colleagues put forward a proposal to lower the cap on debit card swipe fees for, for comment. Could you just talk a little about uh, the considerations there, what it would mean for merchants, for banks, for consumers, and also just what y'all are seeing in terms of the use of both debit and credit cards in the, in the payment system? You know, so you're right. We 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 put a proposal out for comment, is what we did, and you know this is this is a job that Congress assigned us, as you, as you of course know, uh, in Dodd Frank, and all we can really do is faithfully implement the statute. That's that's all we're trying to do. What else can we really do? Um, it's a 90 day comment period. Uh, we typically don't comment on these things once they're out for out for comment, and we do hope that stakeholders and we know that they will use this opportunity to express their views. They haven't been shy about that. So that's that's critical, and that's that's what I can say about that now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. So over the last um, three months, the year-over-year -year PC inflation was at 3.4%, core well over 3%. You've said in the past 2% remains the Federal Reserve target, but with no rate increase today, how long would you be okay then with a 3% or 3% plus for all inflation? You know, the, the progress is probably going to come in lumps and be bumpy, but we're making progress. You know, I think I think the core PCE came down by almost 60 basis points in the third quarter. So if you like, the best thing I could point to you to would be the um, September SEP where, uh, you know, the expectation was that that inflation by the end of next year on a 12, 12 month trailing basis would be well into the twos and the year after that further into the twos. So that's that's if you look historically that's that's sort of consistent with the way inflation comes down it does take some time and as you get you know as, as you get uh, further and further from those highs it may actually take longer time but the good good news is we're you know we're making progress and monetary policy is restrictive and we feel like we're on a path uh, to make more progress and it's essential that we do but you said in the past that doing too little on interest <clears throat> rates could take years to fix, but the cost of doing too much could be easily fixed. How robust was the debate about this pause on the doing too little side? That's always the, the question we're asking ourselves. And um, it, it, we know that if we, if we fail to restore price stability, the risk is that expectations of higher inflation get entrenched in the economy. And we know that that's really bad for people. Inflation will be both more high, uh, both higher and more volatile. That's that's a prescription for misery, and and so um, we're really committed to not letting that happen. Um, you know, for the first year or so of our tightening cycle, the risk was all on the side of not doing enough. We're you know we're we've come far enough that that the risks are, you know have gotten more two sided. I, I, you can't identify that with a lot of precision, but it does feel like the the risks are are more two sided now. Um, and um, but we're we're committed to getting inflation back down to our target over time, and we will. Simon, uh, Simon Urbinovich with the Economist. Um, quick follow up to the question about banking stresses. Uh, you talked about how the banking oh. system is resilient. Uh, of course, Boring. part of the resilience of the past year stems from the the bank term funding program that you launched in March. Yes. Um, given that bond prices, the money printer, bro, over, that unrealized losses are probably mounting. How likely is it that you might have to extend that program uh, in March next year? Likely. Um, good question. we we haven't really we haven't really been thinking about that yet. We uh, uh, we'll extend it. You know, it's. It's November 1, and that's a decision we'll be making in the first quarter. He's punting. They will extend it. I'm um, sorry. Quick separate question about uh, inflation expectations. The U-Michigan uh, <clears throat> sentiment survey showed a big jump in one year ahead inflation expectations Israel. last month from 3.2 to 4.2. Last year, you said that particular survey was a really decisive factor in one of your rate hike decisions. Uh, if it stays elevated uh, next time around, how big of an input will that be into your December thinking? Yeah, we, we look at a a range of, of things. Uh, I, I think the, the the you know the UM thing got blown out of proportion a little bit. It was actually a preliminary estimate that got revised away, and and I said it was preliminary in that, but that didn't get picked up. So uh, <laughs> we, we look at many many things, and so really look across the broad 
array of surveys and also market-based estimates. This guy's and, awesome. You know, and we do that really carefully at every meeting and between meetings. And, you know, there, there's, it's just clear that inflation expectations are in a good place. The public does believe that, that inflation will get back down to 2% over time. And, uh, and it will. They're right. So, uh, and, and there's no real crack in that, in that uh, armor. You can always find one reading that is a little bit out of whack. Uh, or, but, but honestly, the bulk of them are, are just very clear. That, this is it. That uh, the public believes that inflation will come down, and that's, of course, we we believe that's critical in winning the battle. It's lumpy, as you see. This is the U of M. Hi, Chair Powell. Megan Casella with Barrons. Thanks for taking our questions. I wanted to see if you could talk about the neutral rate. You mentioned today that you're still debating whether rates are sufficiently restrictive. Good. And you've recently said that um, evidence is suggesting policy is not too tight right now. So I was curious if you could elaborate on that at all and whether that means the neutral rate in your view has risen. Yeah. Um, so first thing to say is that it's very important. It's a very important variable in, in the way we think about monetary policy. but you can't identify it with any precision in real time. And we know that. So you have to just take that. You have to take your estimate of it with a grain of salt. Um, what we know now is, you know, within a range of estimates of the neutral rate policy is, is, uh, is restrictive. Uh, and it's therefore putting downward pressure on economic activity, hiring and inflation. So we do, we do talk about this. There's, we're, there's not any debate or, you know, attempt to, you know, to sort of agree as a group on what whether our star has moved or not. Some people think it has. Some people haven't said that don't think it has. Ultimately, it's it's unknowable. And so, really, again, what we're focused on is, you know, looking at the data and giving ourselves a little more time now to look carefully at the data <clears throat> by being careful in our in our moves. Does it does it feel like monetary policy is restrictive enough? to bring inflation down to 2% over time? That's the question we're asking ourselves. Um, I, I think, you know, years from now, economists will be revising their estimates of, of R star as it existed on November 1, 2023. You can't, we can't really wait for that in making policy. We have to look, we have to, we have to have those models and look at them and think about them. But ultimately, we've got to look at the effects of po that policy is having, accounting for the lags, which makes it difficult. If I could yeah. follow up on a wages point earlier, you talked about the inflation outlook, but I'm curious if you have any concerns whether wage inflation um, at its current level could be could risk pushing up overall inflation or reacceleration. So if you look at the look at the broad range of wages, um, they have all, the in, wage increases have really come down significantly over the course of the last 18 months to a level where they're substantially closer to that level that would be consistent with 2% inflation over time, making standard assumptions about productivity over time. So it's much closer than it was. Uh, and that's true of uh, the ECI, which is a, the one that's the one that we, we got this week. It's true yep. of um, average hourly earnings and compensation per hour too. So, and all of them are kind of saying that, which is great. And you have to look at a group of them because any one of them can be idiosyncratic from at, in any given reading. So that's what you see. Uh, and so what you saw with the ECI reading was, if you look, if you look back a couple, comes out four times a year. If you look back a couple of quarters, you'll see it was much higher and then it came down substantially in June. And then the September reading was more or less at the same level as the June reading. So in a way, it's just validating that decline. And it was very close to our expectations internally too. So I think we feel good about that. Also, I would say it, it isn't, in my thinking, it's not the case that, that wages have been the principal driver of inflation um, so far, although I, I think it's all—I do think it's fair to say that as we go forward, as monetary policy becomes more important relative to the supply side issues I talked about and the unwinding of the pandemic effects, it may be that that the, the labor market is becomes more important over time too. Nancy. Hmm. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser with Marketplace. Um, Chair Paul, are you now as concerned about overshooting and raising interest rates too much as you are about getting inflation down to the 2% target? So I, I, as I mentioned, um, I think for much of the last year and a half, 
the concern was not doing too much to to not doing enough. enough it was not getting rates high enough in time to avoid having inflation expectations higher inflation expectations become entrenched so that was the concern i think we've reached a, a you know now more than 18 Say months it. into this you can see by the fact that we have slowed down although that we're still we're still we're still trying to gain confidence in in what the appropriate stance is but you can see that um, we think and i think that the risks are, are getting more balanced i'll just say that they're getting more balanced yeah, the risk of doing too much versus the risk of doing too little are getting are getting cl more closer to balance because policy is clear i think clearly restrictive at five and a quarter to five and a half percent that that range you're if you you take off a, a mainstream estimate of the of the uh, expected inflation take one year inflation you're going to see that you're going to see a, a real policy rate that is you know well above mainstream estimates of of a neutral policy rate now that's that's arithmetic. It doesn't really. What, what the proof is really in how the economy reacts. But I, I would say that we're we're in a place where where those risks are getting closer to being in balance. And you said the proof is how the economy reacts. What are you looking at to be sure you're not overshooting? Well, I think <clears throat> what we're looking at is are are we still is inflation still broadly cooling? Do we is it sort of validating the the, the path we saw over the summer uh, where inflation was clearly cooling and coming down now we've seen periods like that before and they've just they, there hasn't been follow through the data have bounced back so mm -hmm. what are we seeing you know are we are we seeing is inflation still coming down so that's the, the first thing second thing is in the labor market um, what we've seen is a, a very positive rebalancing of supply and demand partly through just much more supply coming online and and with with labor demand still clearly remaining very strong when you're when, when you have the kind of job growth we've had over the last quarter it's still very strong demand so and you see wage increases coming down as we, we discussed but coming out coming down you know in a kind of gradual way um, I think that's what we want to see that that whole set of processes continue. Just stop talking. All right, Mena, CNN. Um, oh, no. Uh, do you think that there has been any structural change in either consumption or in the job market that's uh, pushing up consumption? Uh, you obviously saw the third quarter GDP figures, which were strong, and some economists have expected everyone spending to have fizzled out by now. So I'm kind of wondering if, uh, if there's been, been any structural change in consumption. Um. I wouldn't say there's been a structural change in consumption. I would say it's certainly um, been strong. And so a couple of things, we may have underestimated the, the balance sheet strength of households and small businesses, yeah. and that may be part of it. Um, there may be, you know, we've been like everyone else trying to estimate the number of, the amount of savings that, uh, that households have from the pandemic when they couldn't spend on services really at all or, or you know in person services and you know there can still be more of that than we think although at a certain point we have to we're going to be getting back to pre-pandemic levels of savings we may not be there yet so things are for clearly people are still spending the dynamic has been really strong job creation with now wages that are that are higher than inflation in the aggregate anyway and that raises real disposable income and that raises spending, which continues to drive more hiring. And so you've had a really that that whole that whole dynamic has been <clears throat> and also at the same time, um, the pandemic effects are wearing off so that goods availability, automobile availability is better or was better. I think it still is. And there and from a from a business standpoint, there are more people to hire and it is more labor supply. So the whole thing has led to more growth, more spending and that kind of thing and it's been you know it's been good and and the thing is we've been achieving progress on inflation in the middle of this so um it's been a, a dynamic the question is how long can that continue and you know i just think this the, the, the existence of this second set of factors at this time which is the unwinding of the pandemic effects that's what makes this cycle uh unique i think and you know we're still learning uh it that that took longer for that process to begin than we thought, 
and we're still learning about how it plays out. That's that's all we can do. Yeah. Daniel, last question. Last question. Thank you, Chair Bell. Um, Daniel Davis from uh, Agence France Press. Um, just a quick question, following up uh, on an earlier one. Um, uh, with regards to the Israel uh, Hamas conflict, um, you know, uh, the Fed's financial stability report said the Israel Hamas conflict and the conflict in Ukraine pose important risks to global economic activity, including the possibility of sustained disruptions to regional trade in food, energy, and other commodities. We've had organizations like the World Bank warning of a possible, uh, you know, surge in oil prices if the war uh, spreads <clears throat> to other countries in the region. I'm just wondering how the Fed is monitoring these developments in the Middle East. You mentioned they are, and, and and just what you know the potential economic impact could be if the conflict does spread to other countries in the region. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate too much, but I'll just say so. You know, really, the question there is: Does the war spread more widely, and does it start to do things like affect oil prices in particular? Since this is the Middle East we're talking about, <clears throat> the price of oil has really not reacted very much so far to this. As you know, as the Fed. As, as the, the Federal Open Market Committee, our job is really to talk about, to understand the economy and the economic effects. And it's, it isn't clear at this point that the conflict in the Middle East is going to, is on track to have significant economic effects. That doesn't mean it isn't incredibly important and something for people to, uh, you know, to take, take great, really important notice of. But it may or may not turn out to be something that matters for the Federal Open Market Committee as an economic body. But the, what the, so what the Financial Stability Report does is it calls out risks, and that's what it's doing is calling out a risk of that. And the war in Ukraine, the same. The war in Ukraine you know, did have immediately very significant macroeconomic implications because of the connection to commodities. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. There it is. Okay, let's get into a summary. So uh, let's get started. Wow. First things first with j Powell, uh, no papers, no iPad, this time a teleprompter to read off his script. He's changing things up a little bit, but he's also changing some things up with his wording. And this is a big deal. The first thing he says he has his eye on, 8% mortgage rates. Housing was something he really hit on multiple times here. Housing flattened out at the moment. Now his, quote, mind's eye goes to the near 8% mortgage rates. And, quote, we're getting reports the effects of this, high mortgage rates, on housing, quote, could be quite significant. That is a big warning flag for the housing market. And it's one that... Uh, of my startup, which has a fundraise ending today, we are ready to take advantage of. We're kind of excited about that. Bring more housing in the market, but learn about that at househack.com. Read the offering circular. The uh, fundraise actually closes tonight at 11.59 p.m. So learn about that tonight or uh, at househack.com. But anyway, talking about j -Pow, he vacillated a few times by saying interest rates right now are restrictive, but we're trying to get confident that we are sufficient sufficiently restrictive enough. He suggested once that he was committed to achieving sufficiently restrictive rates. It was sort of confusing because he's saying rates are restrictive. So are they sufficiently restrictive? I think he's purposely trying to be a little vacillating in, in his uh, wording here or vacillating in his wording because he doesn't know. That's the thing. He even went as far as suggesting the summary of economic projections we get at the Fed meetings are good for like the day they write them and then you throw them away. The dot plot basically has been wrong every single time they've written it. Every single projection they've given has been wrong uh, pretty much. So who cares about the projections? The point is, what is the snapshot for today? The snapshot for today sounds pretty well like j Pow is comfortable keeping rates here and just watching the progress we're making on inflation and jobs continue. Seeing more of that uh, supply chains, uh, supply chain normalization lead to disinflation. What was really interesting, though, was how he redefined the economy and the next phase. So this is going to take a little bit of thinking. So follow along with this. First of all, he said for like over two years now that the economy is probably going to have to grow below trend. Those have always been his words. He's always been saying, we got to get the economy growing, growing below trend. And everybody's like, all right, well, the trend is 2%. So what you're saying is the economy needs to go below trend. 
Well, today, he actually totally redefined this. And this was like a yet another Jerome Powell flip-flop. It's kind of like one day the Jolts report matters, and then the Jolts report doesn't matter anymore. One day, you know, one survey matters, and the next it doesn't matter anymore. You know, it was like just a few months ago, he's complaining about the employment cost index and how we got to see that come down. Today, he's like, Ah, it's pretty good. We're doing good on the ECI, which was actually surprising because just two days ago when the ECI report came out, employment cost index, the survey was 1%, came in at 1.1, and Jay Powell's like, ah, that's reaffirming the downward trend. We're doing good here. But going back to this redefinition he just came up with today, I feel like sometimes he just pulls this stuff out of thin air. But anyway, now he's saying, well, we're not actually saying the economy has to go below 2% growth. What we're saying is we want the economy to be below its potential growth. Oh, good Lord. Okay. So how do we understand this? Well, a simple way to understand it is with numbers. Let's say that right now in Q3, the economy is growing at 4.9%. Let's say potential growth for the economy for the next year is 3%. Okay. Trend is 2%. Potential is 3%. He's saying, well, we just want the economy to grow below that potential now, which is actually a dovish thing to say. And it's probably why towards the end of this uh, event, the NASDAQ started rallying straight up, basically. That's probably why, because j Powell's really relaxing this idea that, oh, yeah, we've got a lot more work to do on rate hikes. I think we're done. I think by this redefinition, he's made it pretty clear. We don't need to keep raising rates. He's comfortable. If things continue the way they are, inflation is going to continue trending down. It already is trending down, and he's comfortable that we're on a good trend. However, he also expects it to to be lumpy. You know, I kind of think about it like weight loss. You know, like you go exercise a bunch and you're like, why am I not losing weight? Why am I not losing weight? And then all of a sudden it's like you get on the scale and you're like, whoa, all of a sudden I weigh five pounds less. You know how like weird and lumpy weight loss is? You know, it's not like you're losing half a pound a day and you're seeing that gradual transition down. That's actually what makes weight loss hard and frustrating because it's like you work out hard and it's like it's not changing. Anyway, that lumpiness, I think, is what Jay Powell's conveying here that look like we're doing good. He seemed very bullish about that actually today. Dare I say dovish? Like, look, hey, we're doing good, man. Jobs are coming to, you know, into balance. We've got inflation coming down. Let's just stay on this trend. And expectations are good. Oil's not skyrocketing because of the Middle East. Brent is at 84, 82 right now. You realize that's like the trend for the year. It's been a little below, it's been a little above, but nothing, basically no reaction from Israel in oil prices right now, which that's historically what happens when Israel has problems in the Middle East and oil markets don't react too much. But people thought maybe this time would be different. So far, it hasn't proven to be. The weird thing, though, that he said is he said right now the disinflation we're seeing is probably the supply chain portion of the disinflation. He's worried that that might not get us all the way to 2%, that we're actually going to have to see labor markets softening to get the extra like half percent or the extra 75 basis points to break us down to two percent that part i think is a little bit of a risk but it's not one i think we can really speculate on now because it's so long away like let's get the supply chains 100 percent in balance my opinion is you probably don't actually have to break the labor market that supply chains and capitalism and the disinflation of how capitalistic markets work will drive that disinflation down to 2% without the need of breaking the labor market. I believe that's true because of the decade prior to the pandemic, not just the decade prior, but really the past 40 years of opportunistic disinflation. Now, j Powell made it clear, though, that while he doesn't know, that is a concern of his and the committees, that they are going to have to do more in terms of breaking the labor market to really get the last bit of inflation down, that last bit of weight loss, that last little bit of starvation that, to get to your goal. Fortunately, that's still a ways out. That's probably something we're going to be discussing next year around this time because we're still seeing the effects of supply chains in the labor market coming into a balance where they're actually leading these price declines or the rate of increases to decline. Remember, we've had a lot of inflation, but that's not the concern here. The concern is 
the stability of prices and bringing those price hikes back into level. And that's what we're seeing in earnings calls and company earnings reports across industries, with the exception of ski resorts and aerospace, where you still have these supply chain issues. Now, when we look at uh, our uh, bingo card, this is what I got for bingo. We talked a little bit about Congress and a potential debt ceiling crisis. Not a lot. We talked about the Middle East, talked about being open to future rate hikes, though I don't really think that is, is a big thing uh, or a big priority of the Fed. Remember, Jerome Powell opened for the first, at least what I think is in the first time, Jerome Powell opened with, we want maximum employment and stable prices. And he reiterated the maximum employment thing two or three times, but really threw some emphasis on that maximum employment. I think they're really proud right now that they have maximum employment. Jerome Powell calls it historically significant that they're not seeing the labor market roll over yet. And the fact that now, if you couple the, uh, you know, a strong labor market with the fact that he's saying, well, we don't have to be below trend, which is what he said like 10 dozen times before, now he's just saying, we just need to be below potential. That's insane, okay? That is such a redefinition. It is, it's it's a dovish redefinition. That's just the way to look at it. Uh, so we didn't get bingo, at least the way I saw it. We didn't, obviously, we get any kind of talk about fate. Uh, I put it in the corner because I didn't think we were going to get that anyway. No Alan Greenspan, no Paul Volcker, no Arthur Burns. Uh, we didn't get the willingness to cut without employment going up because there was no talk really about even talking about cutting. No iPad. He was on time. The recent surge in yields, yes, does some work for us. The tightening of financial conditions, yes, does some work for us. We did get this below trend growth discussion, which is what we've already discussed. Brief mention there of the UAW. Uh, no, no real talk, though, about that turning into wage inflation. Doesn't really matter because we didn't get bingo anyway. Goods disinflation continuing. We didn't get talk about that. Uh, we didn't get talk about housing disinflation, but we got hints that some that that there was going to be some pain coming to the housing market. Again, I think that's going to be a great opportunity for house hack. We're really discriminatory with our deals right now, picking up on fear, and it's it's a great opportunity. Like for example, we just got a house, a model, almost a model match to a house that sold next to a busy road for eight hundred seventeen thousand dollars. We got it for six, well six oh five. This is like crazy. I mean, how much money is is in that spread? Uh, and that's insulation in the event market. It's correct, right? It's great. Anyway, uh, uh, deflation. We didn't mention deflation. We didn't mention disinflation, services disinflation. We just didn't have that discussion today. He was asked about a pause. He didn't use the word pause, didn't use the word soft landing. This was a big deal. He said they did not put recession back in their forecast. They have little forecasts in the background. They didn't talk about recession being back in. And that's, again, why I think, you know, if a recession is going below this zero level right here. If that's a recession and trend growth is right here, 2%. And right now the economy is at 4.9%, you know, and maybe potential is like 3%. He wants us to be around here, which means we're not really knocking on the door of recession, as j Powell says, in the short term or in the near term. So they're not seeing a recession. And there was definitely a time last year where j Powell's like, yeah, we might be going into recession. Obviously, we touched on banking, banking stability. That was pretty basic. We think that Fed term uh, funding, bank term funding program will last for a while. Uh, increase the supply of workers, 25 to 54. Big increase over here, supporting uh, some of the easing in labor. No pressure on jolts having to come back in balance. Remember, he's kind of flip-flopped on that, which is great. We'll take it. I love the redefining of below potential because it's bullish. It implies a less hawkish Fed going forward. Uh, we also are seeing Treasury yields fall right now. What we should look at is the uh, Fed rate monitor just to see what the uh, December forecast is looking like. My guess it's going to go lower from a 25% chance to lower. The 10-year is plummeting right now. Could be a time for TMF. Look at ticker TMF but this is not personalized financial advice for you. Uh, TMF should be doing uh, well with a, an 11 basis point drop in the 10 year. The two years dropping 13 basis points. When the This is actually a, ooh, wait a second. When the two year drops more than the 10 year and both are going down, this is a bull steepening. Yield curves right now are telling you bullish steepening of the yield curve. You could Google that one. It's a, it's, it's a little complicated and annoying and, and, and how, how it's all calculated and stuff. But once you once you know it, it makes sense. But the bottom line of it is that's what you want. A, a, a bull steepening. 
You do not want a bare steepening. A bare steepening is where you have less inversion, but it's because the 10 years skyrocketing. That's what we just went through the last two months of hell in the stock market. Uh, so the bull steepening, that's actually good. Every meeting is basically going to be live. That's not a surprise uh, that they'll sort of decide meeting by meeting. The, what does the monitor say right now? The monitor for December, uh, it just dropped from 25% chance of a rate hike to 20%. And January just dropped from a 32% chance of a rate hike, actually 36% chance of a rate hike, all the way down to about 25, 26.7%. So you're definitely seeing a compression there. I think this is extremely clear that the Federal Reserve is at peak unless some data comes in like really crappy. November 13th is when we're going to get our next CPI report. But I really need you to mark your calendar for this Friday. Obviously, you know, today we have the expiration of the House Hack fundraise. Uh, email us at irhousehack.com if you have questions. Ideally before five, so we have time to respond. Uh, but anyway... You've got, I'll, I'll be up all night, probably just responding to emails and trying to help as well. Uh, but uh, this Friday, you need to pay attention. We'll be covering this live, 5.30 a.m., non-farm payrolls, okay? Payrolls report, we're expecting 0.3% increase in month-over-month -month average hourly earnings, up from 02 in the last. Expect the year-over-year -year to be 4%, and the change in non-farm payrolls to be 180,000. Uh, again, uh, him thinking that, uh, we we will need to see some kind of additional disinflationary work from the jobs market is just going to mean higher for longer unless supply chains can do all of the disinflation for us. Uh, no recession back in the forecast. The housing warning was very, very clear today. Availability of goods and autos higher, but durable goods spending lower. Surprise, surprise. Those are like cars and washing machines or solar panels or whatever. All those obviously just wrecked right now. Uh, some people say stay the hell away from all of those. Other people say it's a great time to be buying those. Uh, let's see here. Uh, looking at the yield curve, it's confusing sometimes. Looking at some of your commentary here, at AMD 108, AMD. It just shows you when you have a good earnings report and then it goes down in after hours and skyrockets the next day, the stock market is insane. That thing's almost up 10% right now. I've got a position in AMD and NVIDIA. Uh, let's see here. Uh, great. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Yeah. Hey, look, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. This is fantastic. What is this? Somebody's talking about house hack raising at a one-to-one -one valuation. Let's go house hack. That's true. That's almost unheard of in the venture capital space. I, I can't think of another company that's ever done that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. So uh, that's it, folks. I really appreciate you being here. I love you all. Look, I know it's shitty times when the stock market goes down. You know, I it, like it, everything feels like crap uh, when your portfolio is going down. It's it's so hard, but uh, I, really, I really want you all to think to yourselves, you're going through life with a shield and you're getting beat up, okay? Like... Everything's beating on that shield hard. You just, you got to keep putting one foot in front of the other. We're going to get through this. You're not going to forget this time of your life, though. I promise you, this is going to be a time when you look back, you go, damn, that really was a hard time. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to be. And it's because of the crazy money printing we had because, like, we had, it's basically the hangover. You know, we partied so damn hard in 2020 and 2021 now we're dealing with like the two, three year hangover and hangover sucks, man. Like you just want to like lie on the floor and, and like go to sleep and, and you got a headache and your tummy hurts. And it's like, it all sucks, but keep going. Like we're going to get through it. Okay. I love y'all. Uh, and I wish y'all the best. Now let me read this crap. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, licensed real estate broker, and becoming a stockbroker, this video is neither personalized financial nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and market commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. It's just commentary. You got to look at that yourself. I'm not vetting the information. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating the security. And... I personally operate an actively managed ETF and hold long positions in various securities, including those that have been mentioned in this video. Potentially, uh, oh yeah, and I have to say that I have no relationship to any issuers, nor am I presently acting as a market maker in any of those publicly traded companies. Good Lord. Thank you so much. Appreciate you all. We will get through the hangover, I promise. We will do it together. Everybody will have their own strategy, but we'll, we'll do it together. And I ain't going anywhere. I'm not leaving. Thanks so much. We'll see you soon. Bye.